Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, we have a couple of uh, concepts to present to the council. And um, I just want to take a moment to explain to the new council members that uh, before any institute in NIH can publish a funding opportunity announcement that has a set aside of funds associated with it, it must be approved in an open venue by an external advisory group. Now, we always use the council to do our concepts so that you guys know everything that's going through the, the system here. So um, first, uh, let me also remind you that um, there will be a formal vote taken at the end of the, Terry's gonna give a presentation. We anticipate questions and a discussion. At the end of that, I will take a vote asking for you to approve a concept. So Terry, you wanna lead us sure. off with Emerge Comprehensive Genomics Risk Assessment and Management. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rudy. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present our proposal for the next phase of the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, or EMERGE <laughs> network. Uh, this is based on input from our advisors, a scientific planning meeting we held specific to EMERGE, and the current state of the science. Um, so we are um, uh, proposing to use genomic information in the context of other clinical information for genomic risk, uh, risk assessment and, whoops, Okay, so this doesn't really want to work terribly well, um, so that may be a problem. Well, all right, so for risk assessment and management of multiple common complex diseases, uh, recognizing that uh, in order to do this in a, in a scalable way with busy clinicians, that it has to be integrated uh, pretty seamlessly with the electronic medical record and electronic clinical decision support. Uh, so it seemed like a program like Emerge that's focused on electronic medical records was kind of a, a good place to do this. So uh, we have a, um, a number of aims. Uh, four of them are, are sort of, uh, uh, two of them are retrospective and, and kind of methods development, and then two are more prospective and analytical. Uh, we're proposing to use biorepositories linked to electronic medical records to develop, implement, and disseminate genomic risk assessment and management tools for clinical use. Um, first, we would uh, calculate validated polygenic risk scores for several complex diseases retrospectively using EMR-defined phenotypes and available data sets. Uh, to the most, for the most degree, um, these PRSs have not been used on electronic phenotypes. We expect that they will validate, but we don't know that, so we sort of need to prove it. And it might be, you know, for, for some of them it does and some of them not so well. Uh, and then share those distributions, associations, and other characteristics um, out widely and then develop EMR-based methods to communicate genomic risk profiles and relevant clinical recommendations based on uh, polygenic risk information as well as family history and other clinical data. And then prospectively recruit and genotype 20,000 individuals of diverse ancestry, uh, prospectively calculate their genomic-based risk of, uh, for selected electronic phenotypes, and then provide risk estimates and management recommendations, <coughs> management being what the physician and the patient should do about those risks to reduce them um, to them and their providers through the EMR or uh, patient portals. And then use EMR-based methods to assess provider and patient uptake of risk recommendations and uh, the impact on related clinical income, uh, outcomes. Emerge would also continue its efforts to uh, use biorepositories linked with EMR research by expanding and enhancing electronic phenotyping, identifying genomic associations with e-phenotypes, developing and disseminating uh, eCBS tools, enabling integration of genomic findings into the EMRs for clinical research and care, and then disseminating those methods, tools, and best practices to the scientific community. To start with a few definitions, by genomic risk assessment, we don't mean only uh, use of, of uh, sequence variant uh, alleles, uh, but it would be calculation of risk for complex diseases from not only risk allele information, other genomic information that might be uh, current at the, at the time that this is done, such as transcriptomics, for example, or, or epigenetics, uh, family history, and clinical information. <coughs> by polygenic risk scores right now, we mean uh, just uh, risk assessment based on risk allele frequencies. Those are, are primarily identified through um, uh, genome-wide association studies. Family history uh, would be using, uh, is typically using patient-driven web-based tools that integrate uh, into the EMR, such as Ignite's Mitri that uh, uh, NHGRI has, has had a significant investment in, but could be others. Or clinical information, that's non-genomic information, such as lab values, anthropometrics, past medical history, personal habits like smoking, et cetera. 
Risk management would include Im implementation of further testing, for example, such as mammography if indicated, bone density testing, specific gene panels even, uh, or interventions such as drug treatment, surgical um, interventions, et cetera, to identify, treat, or prevent early disease. And clinical risk estimation would be non-genomic information, as I mentioned before, such as medical history, physical findings, and laboratory values that up until now, physicians and patients have been basing their risk estimates on. Uh, diverse ancestry would be uh, defined as non-European plus Hispanic Latino ethnicity uh, per OMB Directive 15. Uh, that, that's these categories here. These are self-identified. And underserved populations are defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities as areas or populations designated by HRSA as having too few primary care providers, high infant mortality, high poverty, mm -hmm. or a high elderly population. Um, and there's a, a website and tools to be able to find these places. There's a nice <coughs> map that shows them all. You can see some in the, in the middle of the country here, but also in, in various areas uh, around the country. Just to remind you, Emerge is, has had three previous phases. It's currently in its third phase. The very first one began in 2007. Uh, can, when we asked the question, can electronic medical records and biobanks be used for genomic research, uh, the answer was resoundingly yes, so the program continued. Um, and we, uh, at, at that time, um, we're focusing on genome-wide genotyping, uh, electronic phenotyping, and, and GWAS studies. In our second phase, we wanted to know, can genomic findings be applied in clinical care, and if so, how? Uh, so some implementation pilots were begun. We expanded into pediatrics and pharmacogenetics, and then continued the e-phenotyping and GWAS studies. And then in the current phase, can sequence data and clinically relevant genes be used to assess penetrance and improve clinical care? Um, and there we added some sequencing, uh, also a, a more mature clinical implementation, e-phenotyping and GWAS. And throughout this, we've uh, conducted ELSI research into each of these topics. So uh, is this, are we ready for this now? Well, recent advances that make the study of genomic risk assessment both manageable and, and uh, feasible uh, is uh, our, our clinically certified dense SNP arrays and imputation algorithms are, are now widely available um, and are, are relatively inexpensive comparatively. Uh, consensus approaches to interpretation of, action, of actionable variants have been developed by groups such as ClinGen, uh, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and others. Professional guidelines for clinical use of actionable variants in high-risk individuals have been promulgated, and there are further uh, efforts to develop such, uh, such guidelines among uh, various uh, professional societies. Polygenic risk scores, and just in the past few years, have been developed for multiple conditions, um, including atrial fibrillation, diabetes, uh, probably both type 1 and type 2, uh, ADHD, coronary disease, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, other cancers. Automated tools for systematic patient-driven uh, collection of family history are now widely available and integrate with the medical record. And um, pharmacogenetic variants that predict altered response to commonly used drugs have been uh, identified and are known to be carried by uh, just about all of us. But there are a number of gaps that need to be filled before clinical adoption of genomically defined risk assessment and management can really become wide, widely adopted. Um, these include development and, and validation of EMR tools for seamless integration of genomic risk estimates into the medical record and delivery of recommended clinical actions in a user-friendly friendly manner uh, using ECDS. Predictable of EMR-derived phenotypes from um, polygenic risk scores has to be assessed. Uh, estimation and validation of PRS in non-European ancestry populations is a major gap. Um, this is uh, an area that's being worked on. Uh, validation of PRS based on e-phenotypes also in non-EA populations needs to be done. Assessing, uh, and uptake, uh, assessing the uptake of risk reduction recommendations across a range of conditions also needs to be done. And estimation of achievable, achievable changes in related clinical outcomes. So, so how much does this affect, you know, LDL cholesterol lowering, for example, or increases in bone density or, or that sort of thing? We, we really don't have that, those kinds of things quantified just yet. I think that the uh, proposal we have for Emerge can address all of these things except the estimation and validation of PRS in non-European <coughs> ancestry populations. Um, there are a number of other programs that are doing this uh, currently and are, are expected to do it um, in, the, in the future. Uh, our genome sequencing program, where a number of the polygenic risk score data have come from uh, to date, uh, the Million Veteran Program, the All of Us Program, to the degree that their data are, are available, uh, the PAGE Program, our population architecture and gen using genetics and epidemiology is, is an entirely minority population, uh, the Top Med Program of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute that is, again, um, uh, extremely diverse. So. We're hoping that these kinds of uh, programs will, will come up with um, a fair amount of information on using polygenic risk scores and validating them in non-European uh, populations. 
So with the objective of retrospective validation and adaptation of the PRS to EMR-defined phenotypes, um, we would use publicly available densely imputed SNP data in 83,000 currently available, 83,000 eMERGE participants, and actually this number is expected to go up to about 100,000 uh, shortly, and then other studies to calculate uh, uh, polygenic risk scores for, say, and again, this is just an estimate, say, 20 complex diseases. And then identify appropriate thresholds, which could be would be defined by the investigators and could be, say, the top one or two percent of risk, or people who are at a three or four fold increased um, uh, odds of disease. What, whatever uh, risk threshold one sets it would need to be high enough that the, that people are are truly identified as being at high risk and can be distinguished from other groups. Uh, for risk reduction recommendations based on current guidelines and budgetary constraints, because there are only so many people in whom we can uh, uh, intervene. And then determine distributions of risk scores uh, across key demographic subgroups, such as those defined by ancestry or by geography or age or, or other things. And then modify the thresholds as appropriate for differing allele frequencies or clinical characteristics. Uh, and this just gives an example of, of some of the uh, uh, risk estimation that does differ, say, from between uh, fin Finnish men and Framingham uh, uh, men, as shown here by Abraham, Abraham et al. Uh, note that these risk scores do nicely separate out the, the Finnish men, maybe not quite so well, although uh, at upper, at older years, it, it does uh, well in Framingham, but mainly because there are different uh, baseline risks. Uh, you're seeing the differences there. And, and similarly, uh, these data from Desican on, on um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, survival free of Alzheimer's disease, does a very nice job of, of picking out the highest risk group uh, <coughs> that ends up with Alzheimer's uh, fairly, at fairly uh, high rates. We would compare risk predictions with specific electronic phenotypes, uh, modify the thresholds or the, the e phenotypes to be used as appropriate to get a, a good concurrence between them, and select some subset, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, 15 risk algorithms for prospective implementation, and then estimate as feasible the added value uh, to the degree that we can, the added value of genomic information to risk estimates based on clinical or non-genomic information. This is only one of, of many analyses that could be done. One could look at the low-risk people. I mean, there are a number of things that could be done with this data set. For prospective risk assessment, we would then propose to recruit about 20,000, and again, uh, these are estimates, of diverse ancestry to undergo clinically certified dense SNP genotyping, family history assessment, and clinical evaluation of risk provide guideline-based estimates and clinical recommendations to providers and patients through their electronic medical records, arrange for follow-up testing and risk management of patients who exceed agreed-upon thresholds, and this is one reason to keep it at a very high level of risk because, uh, again, this is a fairly intensive uh, uh, enterprise. Quantify the uptake of risk management recommendations, so how many people actually got their tests done, how many uh, treatments were initiated, uh, and iterate the approaches needed to reach 50 percent uptake. Again, this is a proposal and an estimate. Why 50%? Well, uh, as, a, as a clinician, I'd be thrilled if half my patients did the things I asked them to do. So, so it seemed like 50% was a, a reasonable way, but one could, one could uh, argue that point. And then disseminate and analyze what will be a very rich data set. Uh, and you know, one analysis that could be done, for example, would be estimate you know, what does the genomic information add. Without doing a clinical trial, we don't feel that we're in a, in a stage where we where we're actually ready to do that sort of thing, but one could figure that out, you know, based on uh, some of the other uh, information in the data set. Risk management um, would include guideline-based interventions tailored to individual patients' estimated risk, and then uh, the risk met, uh, management recommendations would be delivered to patients who exceed the agreed-upon levels of risk. Others would get their information on the risk, but, but really the guideline information would be given to those above a certain threshold. And then design and components of the risk, uh, risk assessment, including the guideline-based risk reduction uh, recommendations, would be proposed by each applicant as they apply. But we have received strong recommendations from our advisors that, uh, that Emerge in its next phase needs to go forward with one protocol rather than you know, six or eight or nine. Um, so there would be a single network-wide protocol for risk assessment and management and outcome ascertainment that would be uh, finalized by steering committee consensus, recognizing that these six words in, entail a host of conference calls and meetings and other things. But we, uh, we do believe that we can come to consensus on it. And then risk assessment and management would be updated as needed as new, new risk information accrues. So these wouldn't necessarily be static, either risk assessments or uh, risk management recommendations, because this is a very rapidly changing field. And we'd have to find a way to uh, uh, incorporate those changes. Data collection would include standard clinical risk factor information for a variety of diseases. I just listed a few here, hypertension, obesity, health behaviors, uh, that would be extracted from the electronic medical record uh, at the beginning and throughout. 
And then outcomes would include disease surveillance or screening uh, interventions consistent with guidelines, uh, drug selection and dosing, again, consistent with guidelines, uh, improvement in, in modifiable risk factors after guideline-directed care, uh, other guideline-directed care such as drug treatment, surveillance practices, other health behaviors. Uh, and certainly would want to look at the cost and utilization of, of health care in the high-risk group. Uh, for sample size estimation, if we had 20,000 patients, and again, this is just a proposal, uh, we may end up with a different number, but if there were 20,000 patients who were screened for genomic risk using a variety of modalities, about 5,000 or 25 percent of patients would be at the top 2 percent of risk for 15, uh, for one or more of 15 complex diseases. Um, the numerate among you will probably say, well, gee, 2 percent times 15 should be 30%, and that's times this would be 6,000, um, but recognizing that people can be at risk for more than one. Um, there would be 400 who would be at the top 2% uh, for any single disease, but again, those numbers can overlap so that uh, even though for one disease it's only 2%, uh, for 10 diseases it's about 18%, and, and for 15 diseases it's about 25%. This would be primarily a descriptive exploratory and methods development program. So um, rather than doing hypothesis testing, we would instead try to describe what actually happened. And uh, one way to do that is to place a 95% confidence interval around the uptake proportion um, to see, you know, did this actually have an impact? impact? Um, so for the proportion of 50% for each disease, for 400 persons at, at high risk of one disease, a 95% confidence interval would be about 5% plus or minus. Um, for um, uh, some subgroup, uh, say, be it, you know, one ethnicity or whatever, uh, if it comprised 20% um, uh, of the high-risk subgroup, the 95% confidence interval would understand be wider, about plus or minus 11%. And then for selecting clinical sites, uh, estimating six to ten clinical sites in a coordinating center, uh, the, uh, a subcontract for genotyping would be uh, included at the coordinating center, so not separate centers for sequencing and genotyping as we've done in some of our other programs. Um, there would be two clinical site um, uh, funding opportunity announcements, one each for uh, more than 35 percent or more than 75 percent uh, diverse ancestry or underserved populations. This is an approach that we've taken in, in each of our two most recent program renewals, it's been quite successful for us. Uh, the reason we've had two is that we recognize there are some areas that simply can't get up to the very high levels um, uh, at the 75% at the range, uh, but we can sort of pull them along and, and bring them into the 35% range. Um, plus, there are some that, that we can actually stimulate to, to go a little higher and strive for that, that higher level, which uh, given the vast underrepresentation of non-European ancestry uh, populations in our studies and in everyone's studies, uh, it seems like an, an appropriate thing to do. Each clinical site should be able to recruit and follow about 2,500 patients, assuming, you know, eight uh, centers who have not previously received genomic information. So these would not be people who had been in other uh, programs, whether clinical or, or uh, research. And then the site should also be able to implement electronic phenotyping, uh, ECDS, and outcome assessment in a comprehensive electronic medical record. They should be able to provide valid e-phenotypes for a variety of outcomes to be determined by the steering committee. And then there are sort of the standard things, you know, how collaborative are they, um, how, what's their record in data sharing and productivity, and what's their expertise, et cetera. Budget assumptions were um, CLIA SNP genotyping at $350. We realize this is a high-ish price for SNP genotyping, but to get at CLIA, these are the prices we were quoted. We expect that those will come down. We also expect that the, the, the costs and prices of, of other forms of genomic assessment will also come down. Uh, the coordinating center would subcontract for the genotyping. Uh, there would be eight clinical sites recruiting 2,500 patients each. Again, these are on average. The cost components could be divided then into sort of fixed, which are, which are independent of sample size um, and variable that are directly proportional to the sample size. And each high-risk patient, we're assuming, would incur an additional amount of testing. We just guessed at, you know, may, let's say it's about 1,250 in follow-up. For some, it's going to be three or $4,000 if they have to get a, a you know, a, a fancy genome panel that's only available um, from one offerer, uh, or, you know, it could be less than that. And again, making, a, making an assumption that about, you know, 20 or 30 percent of that would be paid by insurance, maybe just assume about $1,000 per high-risk patient would be borne by the grant. And then genotyping costs would be concentrated in years two and three. And this is then what the budget looks like for the fixed costs for the investigators, the informatic systems, et cetera, variable costs for recruiting the, the cohorts and genetic and other testing, indirect costs, it's about split evenly among all of those things for a total of 65 million with the highest costs in years two and three. 
and then breaking those down by clinical sites. We, this is just, again, an estimate, but we would estimate about 4.2 million direct costs, uh, perhaps 6.6 uh, .6 million uh, total costs per clinical site. For eight clinical sites, 53 million, <coughs> and then the coordinating center uh, with, the, with the genotyping, 12 million. So these would be the, the estimates that would go into RFAs. So I think with that, I'm finished. Oh, just to give you a, a timeline, we are here currently in mid-February. Uh, Emerge currently goes until about June of uh, 2020. Um, and you're seeing this renewal concept. The RFA would hopefully be released sometime in, say, June. Uh, review, uh, initial primary review in the fall. And we would bring it back to you in February, uh, a year from now. Um, the awards hopefully in the summer and risk algorithm development and, and exploration would begin at that point. The very earliest we'd be able to be, be begin recruitment, I think this is quite um, um, optimistic, but the earliest would be uh, April of, of 2021 or more than two years from now. So a, a fair amount can change between now and then. And I think with that, I'll stop and be happy. Oh, and, and uh, I should note that um, our council discussants are Drs. Deverka, Haynes, and Plon, and I'll start with Dr. Deverka. Dr. Deverka, if you had comments you'd like to make, you don't have to, but if you'd like to. Um, Just a, a couple of comments, uh, particularly about the prospective um, uh, part of this. Um, is there any, had there been thought about having a comparison group, a uh, prospectively collected comparison? Because I really was struck by the importance of what is the incremental benefit of uh, polygenic risk scores over traditional phenotypic measures. And so I think that is an important question. And I wasn't clear if you were saying that you didn't feel like we were ready to actually do that. So could you just expound on that a little bit more? Right. So so the comparison groups could be many in this in this whole large group. So one one logical comparison group might be the people who are just not quite at that threshold, but but close to it. Um, or it could be the entire group. That's the way a lot of the polygenic risk scores have been calculated. Um, we, we didn't feel that we were, were quite ready for a randomized trial, which is really what you would need in order to be able to assess the question that you, you were asking. Uh, but we think there will be a fair amount of, of um, uh, descriptive information that allow us to at least get at it. And I guess the other comment was um, you're, you know, saying that you won't be able to uh, interpret the or validate the polygenic risk scores in minority populations, uh, or underserved populations. Is that right? Is that you're no, relying I, on other data right. sources to do that? I, I would suggest that Emerge would not be the best place to develop those scores. I think we could validate them. But, um, but you know, so that gonna, okay. developing them, you, you need very large numbers with, you know, with dense sequencing information, which is, is being generated in our other programs and programs of other institutes. So, so is there a thought that the risk management recommendations might be any different? in um, underserved populations than for with those of European ancestry if we feel like we're ready. And these are going to be predominantly uh, groups that are 35 to 75 percent uh, underserved. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, you know, if you ask for my personal opinion, no, I don't think there will be any different. Um, I, I really think when, when one is looking at genomic risk, one's looking at risk allele frequencies. To, to date, the um, where polygenic risk scores have not predicted as well in non-European um, uh, groups is because they either don't have the alleles or they don't have them as, as frequently. So the, the risk estimates tend to be poorer. They do not tend to be opposite. Um, one would worry about them being opposite, but, but to date they have not been. And I think in two years we would know much more about that from other, other studies. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Dr. Haynes. So I want to follow up a little bit on the, on the diversity angle because I think we already know that the polygenic risk scores are not going to work as well in any of the diverse populations, and we don't know how well they, they will work. That is an area that, as you say, are, is very much under you know, development in trying to understand that. So could you think of a little or, or expand a little bit on the timing of the recruitment of, the, of the, diverse, the diverse samples? Because if it turns out that the polygenic risk scores from what we know aren't really very good for the diverse samples, and we don't know what the, the good ones are uh, necessarily, then is it appropriate to be focusing on recruiting all those diverse samples at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is a tough one. And it, obviously, we've been struggling with. Um, you'd kind of hate to, to wait to recruit them as sort of, you know, you guys have to wait until we have the answers that we want. Um, in addition, I think, you know, one of the big challenges in, in this field and in any field is that there are always going to be fewer data in, in non-European ancestry populations, always. You know, the, the data, the, the follow-up is going to be less, the data will be less, less complete, et cetera. And so, 
you know, do we just promulgate that by saying, okay, we're not going to even try, we'll wait for somebody else to do it, or do we say, we're going to do the best that we can? And recognizing that risk scores do separate people at risk. They, they may not identify folks who are, you know, between the 20th and the 40th percentile terribly well, but I think one reason to focus on the very tippy top of the risk is, is exactly that, that you, you would be more confident, at least, that you're getting the highest risk people. And remember, it's not just polygenic risk score, it's also family history and other clinical information. You get the people who are at the highest risk within their demographic subgroup. But we'd, we'd need to leave it to the investigators to determine how they would want to do those in an ethnic-specific way. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just a little concerned that you're recruiting people and you may not be able to, to uh, you know, deliver what you're sort of promising, promising to them. So I think it's something you really, you really sort of need to think about. Um, the, other, the other point that I'd like to, to talk about a little bit is the, uh, the inclusion of the non-genetic information as well, because I think it would be really, really useful, and we've certainly seen this in some of the other diseases that I work on, that the, you know, the polygenic risk score actually does no better than using the non-genetic information, and when you add the two together, you don't get any benefit from you know, either one. They're so, sort of replicating each other. So I think it's really useful to, to bring in the non the non uh, the non genetic information, and I think it would be a nice focus of this to figure out what how you get that information out of the EHR. I know that you know they've been working on that for a long time, but there's still a lot of variability in what those what those algorithms can pull. So I think there's that's an area that would be a nice a nice focus. Agreed, and I, and I think um, you might agree that Emerge would be in a good position to be able to do that. Um, so I, I think we can't exclude the non-genomic information. I mean, we're trying to do something that, that will be clinically useful, and, and clinicians are not going to ignore the cholesterol level or ignore their, you know, their three ants with, with breast cancer or, or whatever. Um, but, but I think trying to, to you know, meld those together and, and use that information together is, is probably the best way forward. Can, can we really say that it was the genomics that made the difference? That will be tough. On, on the other hand, there, there does seem to be some evidence that, that perhaps genomic exceptionalism works in our favor here. Because if you tell people that, you know, we, we've identified you to have genomic or genetic risk for something, sometimes that's a little bit more activating than just telling them they're at clinical risk. And there are some small studies that have shown that. Um, so we need to, that's something else we can test. Yeah, no, and it may, be, it may well be that at the very tippy top or the very bottom of the, of the risk that the genetics actually does make a difference. And it's a, that's, we, we don't know, and I think that's something that can, we can find out. Great. Dr. Pon. Uh, so we had three discussants, and then, and then we'll do. Okay. Uh, sorry. So one, one more, and then you. <laughs> then you can talk. Uh, <coughs> Great. Thanks. I, I actually had, I guess, four comments. Uh, I'm actually more optimistic that the polygenic risk scores for diverse populations will be in place to validate by the time you start, I think there is a huge pressure, certainly that was talked a lot about at the strategic planning meeting, and certainly many people in the field are aware of this problem. So I, I'm optimistic about that. I also think, although we didn't talk about a lot in the discussion, the relationship with the electronic health record and the goal of how to disclose this back to physicians, the electronic health record, I think is critical. Most physicians, that's where they get their information about a patient. And whenever we do research studies where they get it other ways, you're not really mimicking uh, real life. And I, I hope that, if anything, we'll learn even how to do it in such a way that other hospitals are willing to adopt it, because I think we solve the problem that the big centers do. I am concerned about this issue of if you don't have a control that you're really going to have difficulty with the data. And so whether these sites will just have to identify an equivalent number of patients or something, or the practices, the standard practice of those physicians, because I just think it will be difficult. But what I was most confused, and this probably relates to what Rudy said about the, the concepts only being three pages long, I did not understand that the RFA or the, the grant mechanism would actually pay for the follow-up care. At least, again, in the cancer sphere, that's expensive. If you put someone at twice the risk of breast cancer, which many of these PRSs do, then the recommendation is breast MRI. And each breast MRI is quite expensive. Um, if you shift people to getting colonoscopy at the age of 40 instead of 50, you know, each colonoscopy is several thousand dollars. So 
my assumption was it was still going to be up to the patient's health care to provide that. I think that if you're doing a mixed model where you pay for some of it, but they're, if their insurance pays, that actually is very difficult to implement. Um, cause either insurance wants to know either they're paying or you're paying. Cause if you're willing to pay for one person, then they want you to pay for their patient too. Um, so I, I would think pretty carefully about that part of the design. No, that's, a, that's an excellent point. I, I think we are hoping, 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 um, that much of it will be paid, particularly the high cost things will be paid by insurance. And I think increasingly that is happening. We thought we needed to include some amount of money for, for some testing that might not be covered by insurance. Um, so that's why we, we came up with this estimate. Uh, but I think he, you're right that we would need, you know, among the investigators and their individual systems or whoever their insurers are, there would need to be some consistency as to what would be paid for by insurance. And that's going to change over time. So, so this is just an estimate. Jonathan. So I just wanted to make a quick comment about the portability of polygenic risk scores. So most of the discussion up to now has been focusing on portability across ethnic and racial groups. Um, but we, we've also been involved in some, some work looking at portability um, across different environmental strata within UK Biobank. And we find that actually um, uh, portability even within a racial group is uh, uh, you know, is not as high as one might expect. Mm -hmm. So we think that genetic differences between groups are only one part of the, the, the differences mm -hmm. that we see in portability. Um, and so that that's also two things. First of all, that you know, I think it's you know, ev even though even though we expect that portability is not going to be perfect between racial groups, I think it's incredibly important to include different groups. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, secondly, that I think that um, you know, t to the extent that we can capture as much environmental information on mm -hmm. individuals as we can, and also include that in the analysis of, of you know, how predictive scores are will be very important. Mm -hmm. Could, can I ask you to clarify? But, uh, can you explain a little more about the other reasons that, um, that, it's, that the portability is low? Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah. um, yeah, so, so, so we have a, a project with Molly Shavosky's lab at Columbia, and, um, and the, in that project, um, we, we've been setting up different, different strata of individuals in the UK Biobank, for example, by SES or, or age groups or, or sex. Like many, like there's various different ways you can, you can um, subdivide individuals within the, um, the white British group. And we find that they're the um, like polygenic scores that you uh, develop in one stratum don't lift as well to other stratas as, as, as they do in a cross-validation set within the same stratum. And so you know, that's probably going to be a, a general principle of polygenic scores. Um, and, you know, so, so genetic differences between populations are also important, I'm sure, but that's not the whole story. And, and so it's important to think about other, other kinds of environmental factors that may be important. We don't have a good handle on those yet. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, yes, Raphael, and then online. Uh, so the, this is, in a way, a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit about why, what's, what are the benefits of having a network as opposed to having a wider distribution of, of investigators doing similar uh, uh, studies? So if you, instead of having, what is it, 12 or eight centers, all and they all seem to, there's not much geographical uh, variability, uh, having many, many, smaller groups doing it and not necessarily coordinate at the at the throughout but more at the end or, or organically sure I mean I think we we would want both ideally so we really would like um, lots of investigators to be addressing this question it seems to be you know a major one um, on the other hand we, we do need to have um, some kind of a, a, a systematic approach to this because it is something that you know in, our, in order to identify the, the very top couple percent of people uh, you need a large population to be able to do that and we also want people to be to be doing them in a, in a sort of a, a similar or systematic way so I think there are two different ways to, to approach this problem we're proposing the one that the Institute would would uh, initiate that would be uh, a large network that would work together um, probably have enough critical mass that it would actually bring the field along which which is what we've seen with Emerge and Ignite and other kinds of programs, but certainly want investigator-initiated efforts to do this as well. A follow-up is again relates to Jonathan's comment is that in general in machine learning problems, systematic 
approaches like this actually end up not working as well because the they all share the same bias. Mm -hmm. By having it distributed and, say, in different environments, then that bias averages out. But if everybody has the same bias, mm -hmm. then so, you, you end up with a bias estimate. Sure, and, and that's... In no, uh, understandable. I, I think in the, from the machine learning standpoint, you obviously know far more about that than, than we do. Um, this isn't only the machine learning algorithm development aspect, which actually, for the most part, is going to happen outside of Emerge. This is really the implementation. You know, how, do you, how do you give this to a patient? How do you provide that information through the EMR? How do you get physicians to follow it, et cetera, um, which are, are thornier problems. So uh, I think oh, Mark was next, and then Jeff. Jeff was. Oh, wait, you do it. Okay. You can see. Good, Mark, Jeff, and then. So the the process of developing a, a new algorithm for eliciting a phenotype from the EHR is still very labor intensive and really a, a low throughput problem, right? Low throughput uh, process. So for the, the 20 diseases you're going to look at, do you already have the phenotyping algorithms in place, or will many of those have to be developed? And if it's the latter, I guess I'm wondering if you thought about trying to incentivize uh, innovation and making it faster to develop phenotyping algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for many of the common diseases that are, are currently have you know have um, polygenic risk scores, we do have e phenotypes developed. Uh, we wouldn't have them all, and that might go into the selection of the diseases that we that we pursue. It takes about a year in, in emerge to, as you probably know, um, to develop one of these. So if there were one that had a really compelling um, uh, risk score, we might try to get the investigators to develop one of those, uh, but. Yeah, incentivizing people to, to develop other e phenotypes is something we would love to see happen. I, I agree with you. So I was suggesting incentivizing um, developing new methods to more rapidly oh. develop the algorithms. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think that's something we should, yeah, we should look into. I, I don't think we can do it in, that's a different program from what we're proposing here, but, but I'm glad that you're enthusiastic about it because we are too. Jeff Botkin, you're next. A couple of <clears throat> quick questions, so I'm going to go ahead and just tick them off, and uh, hopefully they'll be quick. Uh, what's the age range you're targeting here? Are you including kids and, have you, yes. uh, and the elderly? Yes. And uh, have you thought about the possibility of how risk scores may play out in the family context with multiple members who may share a risk score and how that may influence uh, behavior? Um, secondly, are you only looking at conditions for which there are risk reduction measures, so-called clinical utility? Uh, and then if you could just comment briefly on what the nature of the LC component of this uh, is going to be. Sure. So on your first question in terms of ages, uh, we wouldn't have any restrictions on ages. So, so the full age range that the investigators are, are comfortable with recruiting and, and implementing on. Um, in terms of family members, that's a toughie. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that we probably wouldn't want to exclude family members. I'm not sure that we would want to target family members because of the reasons that you say, that, that you know, there would be some confluence of, of um, uh, risk reduction recommendations, perhaps, uh, that would go from the parents to the kids or to the siblings or, or whatever. So, so probably not uh, that. Again, some of these are specifics that, that the investigators really need to define and, and propose and then, be, and then be judged on that. Um, in terms of uh, risk, sorry, risk reduction, Oh, the risk reduction recommendations, um, I, I would assume we would probably be on firmest ground if we were using clinical professional guidelines, and that also gives us uh, much more likelihood of getting reimbursed by, um, you know, by insurance and that sort of thing. So I think that would be where the emphasis would be. Maybe there aren't 15 of these, but I think in two years there probably will be, and, you know, so maybe it's 20 or maybe it's 10. Um, and then your, second, your third question on LC, I think, you know, uh, you guys would be in a better position to propose the LC research questions that, that uh, could be addressed. But I would think, um, you know, what's the impact of telling somebody they're at high risk? What's the impact of telling them they're at low risk? How does that affect their quality of life? How does it affect their behaviors? A number of things. But others that you'd like to propose, we'd love to. Well, know. and from a practical perspective, will each of the centers be expected to have an LC component as part of their um, application? Or are you going to? centralize that with one of the centers or how, how might that play out? I, I think we would let it play out as it as it plays out rather than, you know, I, I think that's one of the, the areas of expertise that anybody who works in this area recognizes they need to include some expertise, but having a separate LC component is probably not something that we would would require of each center. Um, typically what happens in these programs is that we have an LC working group and they propose um, studies that very often then uh, we can come back to our LC colleagues and get additional support for, which we love, um, or, or do within the resources we have. So, 
Wendy. I've got Wendy and then Gail. Anyone else? Wendy. So Terry, in addition to the polygenic risk, obviously a lot of the genetic risk is rare variants that are highly penetrant or moderately penetrant. Um, and I'm, I guess it was probably because of cost that you weren't including that within the analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering, because especially if we think about PRS for um, minorities and if that isn't coming up fast enough, obviously many of these variants though for the highly penetrant genes still could be useful. And if you were to try and um, diversify in terms of using perhaps genotyping and sequencing based approaches, you could cover, sort of hedge your bets, and perhaps get a more accurate total estimate of what risk is by including more things. So I'm just wondering, because I saw the cost of $350 for the genotyping, which is generous in terms of what this would be, and I would bet you could actually get a laboratory to do an exome plus the genotyping for some, with a clinical interpretation for something around 600-ish in terms of that. And I'm just wondering, if that were the case, would that shift in terms of the approach? I think, you know, being the Genome Institute, we would love to capture as much genomic variation as we could. Unfortunately, exomes probably won't do it for us because polygenic risk scores are primarily based on GWAS, and the GWAS, 90% of the hits are not in the exome. Right, but if you did an exome plus a genotyping array, uh -huh. you could actually do both of those in, uh -huh. at a reasonable cost. Uh -huh. Would that perhaps be something that would be more comprehensive, more forward-looking? And given the huge investment you're going to make in, you know, getting this cohort together, that kind of fixed cost, mm -hmm. you would get a much higher yield. And it would be many of the same conditions you'd probably develop PRS for and, and therefore have more positives that you could see what the impact was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's something we could consider. I think, you know, it, looking back at our strategic planning workshop that was held last month, there was also a lot of enthusiasm for uh, genomic information outside of the DNA sequence. And we want to, you know include enough room for that as well. So, so I think this is something that's going to continue to change. We will probably ask what we typically do in these is give certain fixed costs to the investigators just so that everybody proposes on the same, you know, on the, you know, the, the same playing field, as it were. Um, but ask them also to say, you know, if you don't think this is the way to go, tell us why and, and tell us what else you'd like to, to come forward with. Gail. So... Um, yeah, this is a, a lot to take in when not having been part of the planning group and so on. And, and I, I really focused on your use of the word exploratory. So you said this is really an exploratory project. And yet, I think Pat's comment and a couple from others is more, but wait, this is, you know, you, you'd like to be able to generate evidence that can only come through some kind of RCT or having a control group of some sort that's defensible. Mm -hmm. So how could you explain to me how you, you yourself are seeing this as, and I also, excuse me, but I'm also thinking back to the day, the early days of Caesar when it was exploratory and then it was evidence-based the second round. And this is a lot of money and people and time and so on. This is quite, I was going to say, I think this is more expensive for sure, than the first Caesar. No, it's not actually. It's the, really the first not. Caesar, yeah, it's really not. Yeah, the first oh. Caesar was about sixty-five million. This is oh. oh, okay. Well, never mind that comment. Yeah. But, so but, it's a lot of money. It's, yeah. But the but just but the my my question about exploratory versus evidence-based and how you you're thinking about that kind of an investment and sure. yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good point. I'm I'm not sure I use the term exploratory. I think we were exploring. Uh, if I did, um, yeah. I, I think descriptive is more more where we're going with this. We would be exploring the you know the ability of the polygenic risk scores to predict e phenotypes and that sort of thing. But but regardless of what what terminology you use, we really wanted to propose a clinical trial, and we just felt that we weren't a clinical trial. To, yeah, um, we just felt we're not there yet because of all the things we don't know yet. And we're hoping that a study like this could, you know, give us the information that we need to do a clinical trial in the future. But, but really at this, at this phase, we, there's just too many gaps to, to be able to. We do think it's going to give us some important evidence, though, in terms of what people actually do when you tell them they're at very high genetic risk for a, for a condition. Uh, and that we think will be quite useful. I never thought I'd be the person to say this, but I think introducing a pediatric population into this is going to make your hard job even harder, because it really depends. Are you talking about kids from age 1 to 5? Are you talking about kids from age 10 to 15? You're not going to be able to compare them across the adult cohorts very easily at all. 
And so I think if you're starting to try to do the numbers of the number of traits and things like that, I, I would just make sure you're modeling then the diversity of populations. I think that's why someone else asked what age range. Um, if you want to get enough data to go across, it's going to be difficult if some sites come in as pediatric. I mean, I know you've done that successfully in eMERGE, but I don't think it was using exactly these kinds of measures. Um, and there are many fewer interventions in children. Obviously, around things like diabetes and obesity, there are, but those may be quite different in a, in a depending on the age of the child. Mm -hmm. So, you might want to at least think about particular age groups of children if you're going to include a pediatric and an adult population. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's excellent advice. We we do recognize there are scores for ADHD. Uh, childhood asthma, <laughs> autism, so, so a number of childhood phenotypes. Um, it really depends to some degree on what the investigators are comfortable proposing, and so we would rely on them to... Uh, to but don't they have to then agree across all the sites? To conduct the... I mean, for the scores. I mean, would they have to? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just asking, sure. are you going to do an ADHD <coughs> prediction across the entire... So what would, be the, what would be the disadvantage of, of doing that for, for the children that they, that they include? I mean, say you have some sites, as you typically do, that focus on adults and other sites that right. focus on children. You're, you're going to have some, some confounding mm -hmm. by, you know, one group's in Ohio and the other group's in Idaho and that, that sort of thing. But what would be the disadvantage? I just mean your ends are going to go down then. Yes. So if you're looking at breast cancer, none of the pediatric sites are going right. to be able to do anything. And if you're looking at asthma in children, then the adult sites might not be able to do anything. That's all I meant. Okay. So Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's very reasonable. Thanks. Jonathan. Yeah, I just want to reinforce something that the other Jonathan uh, <laughs> said, said earlier. Um, there's a huge confounding between a lot of the environmental variables and ancestry, as, as we know. So when you start to look at that kind of thing, I think you have to be very careful to, about that confounding, and it may have a significant effect on some of the sample sizes and some of the power that, that you have to, to pull some of these things apart. So as you go forward, I think that's something you probably should be very careful about thinking about. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? All right, I think that was a really good discussion. And uh, well, I would like to move forward with a vote. Can I get a motion to approve the concept? Thank you, Jonathan. A second? Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Rafa. Okay, thank you, Terry.